can do the trick. Yeah, recording. Okay. So, tonight's uh, class is based on this verse, uh, which talks about the idea of illness. And there's two approaches in the verse. <clears throat> yeah, we're recording. So, the two approaches in the verse are um, that, again, this is the verse in Deuteronomy 7.15. And it talks about God removing the illness from you and not placing upon you the illness, all the illnesses and diseases which uh, were prevalent in Egypt. Now, without going to the history of all this and what it's all about, let's just uh, focus on two things over here. There's one type of healing in which the illness is removed. There was illness, there was sickness, and the sickness is removed. There's another type of uh, healing, which is really, I would suppose, what you would call preventive healing or preventative healing, in which the illness doesn't affect you in the first place. Obviously, the second uh, type of healing is the uh, preferable one in all respects, where there's no illness that has to be healed. Now, we need to understand these concepts uh, on a deeper level, in other words, on a Kabbalistic level, what the idea of illness and what the idea of healing is all about. So first of all, what's the idea of illness? In um, Kabbalistic terminology, we often look at the um, numerical value of the letters of a word. So the word in Hebrew is... Um, let me just type it out in Hebrew in the chat. The word chole in Hebrew, and I will uh, explain what that means. It means sick, right? Illness. Someone who is ill is called a chole. And uh, I suppose you would write that in English like this chole, C H O L E H, I guess. But in any event, uh, the numerical value of this word chole looking in the chat box, the word chole, the numerical value is 49. 49. The gematria. Lamed is 30. The letter Lamed is 30. And then uh, 5 and 6 together is 11. So that's 41. And Chet is 8. So 41 and 8 is 49. The numerical value of the word chole is 49. So our sages explain that what, um, what makes a person ill is that he's missing the fullness of 50. What is 50 and what is 49? 49 is one less than the 50th gate. Our sages explain that there are um, 50 gates of understanding, Nun Shara Binahim. It's based on... Um, Sefi Yitzira, the Book of Formation. The Book of Formation said that there's 50 gates, 50 gates of understanding. 50 gates of um, grasping things in a satisfactory way, in other words, in a way that makes the person satisfied, that would be all 50 gates. But when there's one gate missing, when there's only 49, which is the numerical value of the word chole, sick, ill, then uh, that's when a person is ill. That's what um, uh, it says in, in various Kabbalistic works. In the Arizal, in the Zohar, uh, speaks about uh, this, this idea. But what does it mean? Well, basically, the idea is as follows. Every person is comprised of a soul and a body, as we know. But the, um, the soul itself is pure and is never tainted. And the body itself can become, uh, as we know, it can become spiritually impure, it can become tainted. But there are two forces that are associated with the soul and the body that um, are in, constant, in a constant state of battle in most people. They are called <coughs> the Yetzah HaTov and the Yetzah HaRa, or the inclination towards good and the inclination towards evil. Now, note carefully that I said the inclination towards evil, 
and not the evil inclination. Why? Because the inclination towards evil is not in itself an evil thing. We are given this Yetzahara, <coughs> this desire for things that are not beneficial for us, in order to cause us to grow, in order to cause us to, um, to, to, to become spiritually mature. If one's given everything, uh, you know, you're given your cake on a platter, um, that is not conducive to growth. You know, you see these, um, very often you see it uh, in, in colleges, like these, these super privileged kids that come from very wealthy families and very, uh, and so on. They're just, um, uh, not obviously not all of them, but um, many of them are just like not nice people. They're just not pleasant people for one simple reason that they've just, they're immature. They're, um, they've, they've learned the habits of, I'm entitled to everything. And unfortunately, there's, um, <laughs> there's a lot of people in that category today who think that they're entitled to everything and they don't have to work for it. I'm entitled to all kinds of things that I don't have to work for. So therefore, God gives us um, initially a... Um, as Martin puts it, a beast crouching at the door, which is called the Yetzahara. At the same time, as soon as we mature a little bit, um, for um, Jewish females, for women, they receive a Yetzahatov, the, inclin the inclination towards good at the age of 12, or 12 in one day, and boys only at 13 in one day, right? Uh, at the age of Bar Mitzvah or Bat Mitzvah. In other words, girls mature spiritually earlier than boys. They mature physically earlier than boys as well, usually. But uh, but certainly spiritually, they they mature a year earlier than uh, than boys do. Uh, there's very good reasons for that, but without going into them now, <coughs> uh, yeah, that's I call it affluenza. Exactly, <laughs> that's a sickness called affluenza that the uh, that some you know entitled people have. Okay, so. What happens is, when there is not a proper balance between the nefesh, uh, I'm sorry, between the yetzahara, which is also sometimes called the nefesh hamahamit, the animal soul, and the Yetzirah Tov, which is sometimes called the godly soul, they are not exactly the same thing. In fact, the um, the emotions of the animal soul are what are called the Yetzirah, and the emotions of the godly soul are called the Yetzirah Tov. The good inclination, the emotion, the emotional qualities of the godly soul, the um, Yetzahara, the evil, the inclination to evil, um, is the emotional qualities of the animal soul. So what happens is, because um, there is not a proper balance between the godly soul and the animal soul, the animal soul is missing something. Or the Yetzahara is missing, the inclination towards evil is missing. It feels like it's missing something, so it goes searching. That's what basically illness is all about. In other words, let us, uh, uh, when uh, Kabbalah says it's missing the 50th, a person who is sick is missing the 50th gate because he's chole, chole is numerical value of 49 is missing missing the 50th what does that mean he's missing the aspect of what's called ayin he's missing he's missing the uh native law yada ayit as it's called in um in the safety of Syria brings a, um, a, a verse from job that calls that 50th gate the path or sorry not the 50th um the 50th path the 50th gate native Lawyer Dao Ait, Lawyer Dao Ait. That's the it's the gate and the path that uh, that that even a um, an eagle doesn't know. In other words, it's hidden from the eye, even from a uh, view from above. That that gate is hidden. 
well, the Nativot and the Sha'arim are two different things, but nevertheless, that, 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 that concept is um, the same in both of them, that there's an aspect called ayin, nothingness. An aspect which is called spiritual self-nullification or nullification in the divine. When a person is missing that, when he's missing that nullification, when he's missing that feeling of being davuk, cleaving to godliness, when a person's soul is missing that, that's, what, that's the beginning of illness. The beginning of illness, in other words, starts off as a spiritual malady. The inability to grasp nothingness or the inability to experience lack of self, lack of ego, lack of self, lack of um, um, egotistical, um, actually egotistical is the wrong word. It's a lack of um, the feeling of one's, the, the awareness of one's true self. That's what illness is, when one's lacking the feeling of, uh, of one's true self. In other words, there could be and there will be a feeling of self, but in the wrong sense. It's the feeling of self that leads us on, that leads a person on towards evil. It's an inclination towards self-aggrandizement. It's an inclination towards self-satiation, uh, but in the wrong way. Not self-fulfillment, really, but um, self-indulgence. Let's put it that way. That's probably the best word. Self-indulgence is the result of not being aware of the nothingness, the ayin, that is the natural state of the soul. How does that happen? That happens from too much of a concentration on uh, self-indulgence, as far as the, um, uh, the animal soul, the indulgence, the self-indulgence of the animal soul. We all know that one of the causes, one of the greatest causes of illness, and particularly in this country, in America, one of the greatest causes of illness is eating incorrectly. Usually associated with overeating, uh, but also associated with eating the wrong kinds of foods. There are some foods that are spiritually harmful to us. Certainly these are laid out uh, in the Torah for, uh, for Jewish people, what kind of uh, foods are spiritually harmful for us. But for anybody, there are certain foods which are, uh, which are spiritually harmful. The indulgence in these kinds of things turns a person into, like for instance, um, there's, a, um, there's a category of person who's called a ben sorero more, like a rebellious, a rebellious child, a rebellious son. And the Talmud, in discussing uh, what brings him to a state of rebellion, says that this person indulges in uh, in too much meat and too much wine. He drinks too much wine and he eats too much meat. Now, believe me, I'm a carnivore just, <laughs> just like almost everybody else around here, I'm sure. And uh, I'm not saying that one shouldn't eat, uh, one shouldn't eat meat. Um, but there's a certain um, um, there's certain restrictions on eating meat that are um, laid out in the Talmud. I'm not only talking about the kosher laws, the dietary, kosher dietary laws, but I'm also talking about the idea of indulging in meat um, too often. Now, what's the problem with indulging in meat too often? It's not really only meat. It's generally indulging in foods in such a way that one becomes completely absorbed in the food instead of the food being absorbed into you. Uh, you can become sort of absorbed into food. Like there's a story of the Baal Shem Tov, that the Baal Shem Tov once walked into a... Uh, uh, there was a some kind of celebration, and uh, he, he he glanced at the head of the ta at the uh, table at the head of the uh, whole banquet, 
And he said to one of his disciples, uh, who's, who's that sitting at the, <laughs> at the head of the table? With a, with a strimal, a strimal is that like that fur hat that, um, that some Hasidim wear um, on special occasions, on uh, festive occasions, like on Sabbath or on uh, festivals. So he said, who's, who's that person there sitting with a strimal? It's made of fox fur usually. Um, so his student looked at the Baal Shem Tov and he said, that's uh, such and such, uh, whom you know. So the Baal Shem Tov said, ah, I didn't see him. I saw an ox wearing a strimal, an ox wearing a hat. <laughs> um, so what, what did he mean by that? He meant that the person was so involved in his uh, grazing that in his filling his mouth, that he kind of looked like an ox. There's a, there's a, there's a principle in uh, Hasidic thought that says like this, where a person's thoughts are, that's where he is. Where a person's thoughts are, that's where he is. So, um, the indulgence of the animal soul in the physical world around us, and when I say indulgence, I mean overindulgence. One has to eat and one has to drink and one has to be, uh, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with eating a good meal and eating uh, preferably healthy food and preferably food that's going to be spiritually beneficial to us, obviously. Um, but it's the indulgence component that is just as damaging as, uh, you know, eating foods that are unhealthy because they're spiritually unhealthy. That indulgence is spiritually unhealthy. So, when a person is indulging his animal soul, that is Megara the Yetzirah. It 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 it, it uh, arouses the inclination towards evil, towards doing bad things, towards doing evil things, and then the person fear gets more and more dragged into evil, and that's how the person becomes ill. He becomes ill because he's lacking. He moves further and further away from the illumination of godliness in his soul. And that's what illness is all about. Illness is, illness comes about because of lack of illumination of the soul. Now, Obviously, preventive medicine, so to speak, in other words, making sure that that doesn't happen, is the proper way to treat um, all illnesses, to prevent them from happening in the first place. How does one prevent these things from for illness from happening in the first place? By illuminating oneself with the light of wisdom the wisdom of the Torah, particularly the light of Kabbalah. When one is illuminated with the light of Kabbalah, then that 50th gate, so to speak, the 50th gate shines into a person, and the, the, a person who was chole is no longer chole, is no longer, longer 49, he, he, feel, he she feels a sense of spiritual fulfillment, that's the 50th gate. What, however, what happens when a person has already moved away from there and now is, has become physically ill, not just spiritually ill, but the physical illness is a result of the spiritual illness. As we all know, uh, the, pri the paradigm of illness in the Torah is a leper, someone who has leprosy. In other words, what's called in the Torah a metzorah, metzorah or tzarat, tzarat leprosy. Now, leprosy, according to our sages, was a spiritual illness. It manifested in physical form, but it was essentially a spiritual illness. And that spiritual illness, leprosy, in order to be able to cure it, what did a person have to do? He had to be removed from society for a certain amount of time, initially for seven days. Had to be removed, and then there's the whole purification process, etc. That has to be administered by a coin, which I'll explain why in a minute. 
the first thing that has to happen is a person has to withdraw from society and go into isolation. Now, when I say um, um, we're talking about leprosy here, it doesn't only apply to leprosy. It applies to all kinds of spiritual illnesses. Leprosy, the, the way the Torah talks about it, we don't have anymore because we don't have that spiritual uh, cure and therefore we don't have the spiritual illness. But all illnesses of any sort are basically a derivative of that illness of leprosy, the way the Torah sees it. Before uh, the time of um, um, before the time of Abraham, there was no such thing as illness. Illness began in his time, and uh, the midrash explains that he actually asked that there should be illness, so that a person could have time to reflect and time to think instead of just dying sort of instantly, um, without any warning. Abraham prayed that there would be a period in which a person could experience illness, in other words, not complete health, in order to be able to bring him to a state of mind where he can restore his health through proper action, through proper thought, through proper behavior, through proper emotion, etc., etc. So, the idea then of isolation, of isolating the leper, is to make him or her reflect on what it is that they done, what that they that they have uh, had done. Most of leprosy, the sages tells us, tell us, came from evil speech, the evil tongue, speaking badly about other people. Now, it's not only speaking bad about other people, but it's also speaking bad about situations. In other words, looking at the bad in everything, looking at the rottenness in everything, that results in a disease which looks like rottenness on the surface. It manifests itself in that way. So the first thing that one has, though, that has to be done is a person has to be isolated so that his behavior towards others is not happening because he's on his own. And his behavior, his speech patterns, because he has no one to speak to, it's a time to, for, for such a person to reflect on his speech and rectify the damage that his or her speech has caused and rectify the damage that his or her way of thinking has caused. In other words, looking for the bad in everything. When there's a person who looks in, uh, looks for evil and looks for the bad, looks for the darkness in everything and not the light, that illness in a spiritual sense becomes manifested as an illness in a physical sense. It becomes manifested sooner or later as a physical, uh, physical illness. So it's very important to change the frame of mind. The first thing that's necessary, therefore, is isolation. So the first step in healing therefore, is a period of self-isolation. It could be a few hours, it could be a day, it could be more than a day, it could be uh, several days. And um, however long it takes in order to rectify a negative way of thinking, a negative way of speaking, a negative way of acting. Thought, speech, and deeds are called the garments, thought, speech, and deed are the garments of the soul, thought, speech, and action. All those three garments need to be checked for truth, veracity, and for um, the, the way in which they operate. If they operate in a negative way, always looking for the bad, always looking for the negative, always talking about the negative, always acting in negative ways, and when I say always, I'm exaggerating. No one acts always in negative ways. Uh, maybe very, very few people do, but um, let's not say always. Let's say constantly or regularly. So that's the beginning of uh, that's the beginning of illness. Why? Because that pushes away the goodness. It pushes away the goodness, which is the godness. In other words, let me just. Um, 
quote a verse that explains this. There's a verse that says, Ta'amu uru'u ki tov Hashem. Taste and see that God is good. Taste and see that God is good. The word ta'amu, taste, can also be um, translated as um, reason. Use your reason, use your mind to look for the good, to seek the good in everything. Ta'amu, right? Use your ta'am, your reasoning, your process, your thought process to look for the good, even though they may be bad. But look for the good in things and focus on that and look with your eyes, see the good in things because there's nothing that's completely or almost nothing that's completely evil. Everything has some redeeming feature of one sort or another. Uh, I have to say that, um, that um, I was reading recently uh, an account of one of the worst uh, um, beasts in, uh, in, in modern history and possibly in all of history, uh, Adolf Eichmann, who's a, a beast of a person, a, a cruel, you, can, you can't believe. But one of the jailers who knew him when he was captured, he was captured by Israelis and eventually put to death uh, after the Nuremberg trials, so he said that uh, Eichmann, towards his fellow prisoners, was actually uh, a gentleman. He helped other people, he encouraged other people, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not trying to <laughs> redeem him in any way, believe me. But if even Adolf Eichmann had some positive quality to him, that could tell us that everybody, it doesn't matter who it is, everybody who is above Adolf Eichmann, for sure has redeeming qualities. If we look for those and get them to get the person, the sick person, to emphasize those, to bring out that good quality in themselves, that's already on the way, that's already the, uh, the, the, the first step towards healing. So, when a person has become physically ill, a period of inner isolation is necessary. Uh, we're not talking about necessarily going to quarantine, um, but a spiritual quarantine. In other words, a person needs to examine. We're not talking about, obviously, if you have a cold or you, uh, you, know, or you got the flu or uh, you have a stomachache or something like that, although in, you know, in some cases it may be uh, useful to do something like this. But when a person gets a serious illness, the first thing to do is to take a day to examine one's own thought, speech, and action, and resolve to improve that. Then to start looking always for the godliness in the city, in other words, the goodliness, the godliness in the situation. Look for the good, look for the light in any situation that there is, even in darkness. Look for the light in that and attempt in whatever way uh, is possible to increase that. Automatically, when a person starts to do good things, positive things, um, happy things, things which are spiritually uplifting and nourishing, automatically the illness starts to lose its hold over the person. The illness, is again, is a result of um, moving away from the inner core of our true selves, which means the feeling of self-nullification in the presence of the divine, in the presence of God. Moving back towards that, deals with the illness. Now, I'm, I'm not giving, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor and I can't say that uh, everyone's going to be cured uh, from their physical illness um, in such ways, but very often you will find that, um, and there's many stories documenting this, that when a person starts to latch onto, focus onto, 
the positive things in life that automatically helps to reduce physical illness. And um, that is what the verse here is uh, suggesting. When it says that God will remove this illness from you, he'll, he'll remove the illness from within you, he can only remove the illness from within you if you let him in, right? If there's godliness within you. In other words, if you open the door, you have to open the door. God removes the illness, but you have to open the door. And let uh, godliness in is a famous uh, story, which I think I've mentioned here many times. Uh, Kotzka Rebbe, who once went into his uh, synagogue, the shul, and he posed the question, where is God? So everyone said, Rabbi, like, what, what kind of question is that? Everybody knows God is everywhere. So he says, nope, God is only where you let him in, right? Uh, in other words, he, he's, God is, so to speak, so humble that if you don't want him there, he won't be there. He, you, if you don't let him in, he won't come in, usually. So the first thing you have to do is let him in, and then uh, the illness starts to become uh, removed that way. Um, now, in Kabbalistic terminology, uh, it gets a bit more complex uh, than this. The, um, the idea of um, I am God who heals you is, there's a verse which states as follows. Um, ki, Ani, Hashem, Oop. Sorry, that's the wrong order here. Here we go. Ki ani Hashem rofecha. No, no, I was right before. Okay, I will show it to you shortly. Um, so, I am God who heals you. The, um, the initial letters of this spell out the, uh, the, um, the word, the uh, word, it's in the wrong order, but it spells out the letters of Keter, of Arich. Arich is the outer dimension of Keter. Okay, so what this means is that in order to be able to heal oneself, in order to have the I, I am God who heals you, Ani Hashem Rofecha, one has to draw down Arich. That's the 50th gate. The 50th gate is the gate of Arich. That opens, it opens up the door to Arich, so to speak. Arich is the aspect of Keter, which affects all of the other Sfirot. So when there's an illness in the Sfirot, in other words, there's an illness in the spiritual powers which the Sfirot represent, the way to cure that is to draw down from higher than from the, uh, is to draw down from the source of all the Sfirot. The source of all the Sfirot is Arich. Um, in English, there will be Irish like that. Oop, no, sorry about that. There you go, yeah? <laughs> okay. Uh, Irish. So, in order to be able to heal, that means we have to draw down from a higher place than the origin of all the powers of the soul. But in order to be able to do that, one has to become nullified. Why? Because Arich represents the will. It represents God's will. Right? Arich is the sphira that represents will. Chokhmah is wisdom. Bina is, uh, is understanding and so on. But Arich represents the idea of will. Whose will? Let me do his will as if it were my will. Let me do God's will as if it were my own will. And then he will do my will as if it was his will. That's what the sages say in Pekarabot. Um, let me do his will as if it was my will, so that he'll do my will as if it was his will. Um, and it's not a quid pro quo, that's just the way things work. If you nullify your will to his will, automatically 
the things that you need and the things that you uh, really want to see happening in the world are a very strong likelihood, a very strong uh, possibility. In any event, that is the idea of healing. So the first method of healing is to prevent all this happening in the first place, prevent illness happening in the first place. How do you do that? By being in sync with your godly soul, being completely in sync with your, in sync with your godly soul. Healing illness means that we have to draw down from the essence of the godly soul into the animal soul, into the Yetzahara, the inclination towards evil, in order to rectify it and make sure that we don't increase the illness rather than decreasing it. The way to do that is to reach up towards Arich, the Svira called Arich, the outer dimension of Keter, in order to elicit the light from Keter that it will rectify and heal, bathe all of the other Svirot, so to speak, in its light, and that heals them and brings the person into proper balance, which means giving up our will for the sake of the divine will and um, nullifying ourselves in order to uh, actually, in the end, benefit from perfect uh, spiritual and physical health. Okay, any questions? So there is a question here that I didn't notice from Terry. Isn't fearing God what is missing what gives rise to feeling of the right as opposed to when we must earn the right? Yes, that's true. We, uh, we, we, we have to earn the right uh, rather than feel that we're um, entitled. Yes, for sure. That is true. If a healer cured a person's illness, could that be judged as interference with the Creator's plan to instruct that person? No. Uh, that's a very interesting question. And in fact, in uh, I believe, if uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, anybody, but I believe that that is a Christian doctrine, that really you should be healed by your faith alone. Now, the Torah says, um, um, it's talking about uh, when a person gets injured, um, then the party who injured him has to pay for the, um, the medical expenses of healing that person. And the expression that's used there is, he shall surely heal him. He will heal and heal him. He shall, shall surely heal him. So the sages commenting on that, so there is double, double expression of healing, explain on that verse that Doctors have been given permission to heal. Doctors have been given permission to heal. And therefore, they've been given the powers to heal. But the power really belongs to God. I am God who heals you and not the doctor. Arrogant doctors don't really heal. <laughs> Arrogant doctors, unfortunately, cause a lot, of, a lot more problems than uh, you might have started out with. Um, so it's important to find a doctor who understands that his power of healing is a gift from above, but it is perfectly legitimate to use those powers of healing to heal people. Uh, at least in Jewish thought, it's certainly fully le legitimate. And uh, not only is it legitimate, but it's in fact regarded as a good deed, a mitzvah. It's something that we, uh, that we should strive to do. So Shirley asks, does this pertain to born illnesses of newborn babies? Um, that is a good question. Probably, um, you know, the individual cases have to be judged, obviously, individually, but probably one would say that the um, illnesses of a newborn, of newborn babies are either as a result of something that happened in a previous incarnation, and this is just a rectification thereof, or it could be that um, it's a result of the parents, that this is the child bearing the um, parents' iniquity, so to speak. Um, unfortunately, that happens. I hope that answers the question. Um, but if a child is ill, then the same thing is true. It's the parents that ought to attempt to, uh, you know, we're talking about a newborn child, um, attempt to restore the child's health by improving their own behavior, the parents of the child in particular. So the parents are needed correction through the child. Yeah, it can happen that way, yes. It's not always the case. It could be the child's own... Um, 
previous incarnation, previous Gilgul, but um, uh, healing doesn't often mean healing the disease itself because the fact that it can be a cause of greatness like Helen Keller maybe. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Now, people can be struck with illnesses and, uh, and, and diseases and things like that and nevertheless um, overcome them and, um, and benefit the rest of the world. But that's, in a sense, that's her cure, isn't it? That was her cure. Um, Helen Keller was, as you know, probably from uh, the story of Helen Keller, she, uh, she wasn't born blind and deaf and, uh, and so on. But she suffered an illness, and uh, that's what happened. But when she turned blind and deaf, um, and dumb as well, if I'm not mistaken, because um, she forgot how to speak, um, she became an absolutely wild uh, child that was uncontrollable. It was only through her teacher, I forget what her teacher's name was, Anne Hemingway, maybe, something like that. Is that correct? I don't remember. Um, Anne Sullivan, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, through Anne Sullivan, uh, she became a real gem. She became a gem of a person. But that was, she had to be taught how to accept her shortcomings, her physical shortcomings, and use them for the benefit of other people. That was her cure. She did have to go into isolation for a while. I don't know if you remember the story. She was in isolation for uh, quite a while with her teacher, but she was in isolation from everybody else during the week. No one was allowed to talk to her or have any interaction with her other than her teacher. And um, that eventually brought her around to a different way of thinking and a different way of approaching. Look, we're not blaming uh, Helen Keller for the way she was, uh, for the way she was, for the way she was behaving. Uh, you know, she went through a tremendous shock and pain and difficulty and, and so on. But um, Moses had difficulties with speech. Yeah, he did have difficulties with speech. Um, the sages uh, explain that as a child, when um, his mother put him in the basket of reeds in the Nile River and uh, Pharaoh's daughter found him and brought him to the palace, Pharaoh was very suspicious because he knew this was a Jewish child, that if they found him in the river, and uh, this might be, they knew um, that um, eventually the kingdom would fall as a result of uh, a Jewish leader. So he was very, very suspicious. And what he decided, he devised a test for Moses, and the test was that he placed before him a crown or a jewel two different uh, explanations of the, of the same um, word, a crown or a jewel in front of him on one hand, on the other hand, a burning coal. And to see which the child would reach for. So the story the Medrash tells is that Moses actually reached for the crown or the crown jewel. And the angel Michael, knowing that that would be the end of him, because uh, Pharaoh would uh, throw him back into the river, and this time without a basket, uh, Michael went and knocked his hand, and so he grabbed the coal and put it to his mouth. And his mouth got, mouth got burned as a result, and, um, and that's how he had a, a speech impediment. That's what the Midrash says there. There are other explanations that it's not that Moses had a speech impediment per se. Um, it's that he was unable to express himself being that he was such a lofty soul. He couldn't express himself in the common language of man. In other words, he couldn't make himself understood easily by people who were not on his uh, level and no one was on his level. Even people who were remotely close to his level. Um, perhaps could understand him, but others who were not close to his level simply could not understand. He couldn't make himself understood. That was his speech impediment. So what were the sicknesses of Egypt? Well, there were many sicknesses of Egypt. 